Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I am at the Supercharger in Athens. And interestingly enough, I don't know if you can see that, but it says Tesla Energy and there's somebody working on the Supercharger back there. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I was going to do a video today and sorry for the fingers. <laughs> I'm <laughs> mounting this thing for me. There we go. So I don't have to hold it the whole time. Anyway, I was going to do a video today on the one year anniversary of the Y and Sexy, our Model Y. Um, but uh, uh, something rolled across. One of my Patreon patrons um, let me see something that was kind of, uh, I don't know, breaking news, but also kind of ridiculous. So I thought it was worth doing an episode on. And that is that there's been a post on Facebook, apparently shared a whole bunch of times, talking about how much carbon and how much energy it takes to charge up a car like this. Uh, and absolutely, it takes a good deal of energy to charge a 60 or 70 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, this thing, this post on Facebook was, it's, it claimed that for a 66 kilowatt hour battery pack, it would take 85 pounds of coal and or, or, or <laughs> eight barrels of oil to fill up a car. In other words, to generate the electricity, to transmit it, to have all of the losses and all of that kind of stuff that take place in transmission, and then to uh, put it into your car and have the losses with that. As it turns out, of all things, USA Today, which um, I don't know if any of you are, are old enough to remember this, but I remember when USA Today actually started into existence. It was a little bit of a lowest common denominator newspaper, and I'm talking about an actual physical newspaper. It had nice, bright, colored graphics and things like that. The stories tended to be relatively light stories. They tended to be, again, kind of lowest common denominator story. So they weren't exactly, they're not exactly highbrow journalism, but fascinatingly enough, they actually did a really good fact check on this particular story and determined that it certainly was not true using a person, let's see, it was Ian Miller from MIT, which seems like a reasonable source. So anyway, let's take a look at this. So the Facebook article, the Facebook post claims that it would take 85 pounds of coal to charge a 66 kilowatt hour battery pack. In fact, Ian Miller said that it would take about 70 pounds of coal to do this. And again, this is if you just had coal-fired power plants, which I think in the United States, at least, that the closest to that would probably be West Virginia. I think that has the heaviest amount of coal-fired power plants. So anyway, so that's the worst case scenario would be 70 pounds of coal. And then the Facebook post said that it would take six barrels of oil. Barrels, that is a lot of oil. Whereas Ian Miller said that it would actually take eight gallons of oil, eight gallons. So if you think about filling up an average fuel tank of maybe 15 gallons of gas for people outside the country. Gosh, what would that be? Six kilos, five kilos, something like that. Anyway, uh, it, or, or multiply by four to get liters. So, you know, 30, 60 liters, 55, 60 liters, what approximately that sort of range. Anyway, it would only take that amount. And, and well, I mean, it would only take eight gallons. What I was saying was that the average amount of a gas tank is like 15 gallons. So <clears throat> if you looked at it in terms of energy usage, a one-to-one -one comparison with a car, you'd be filling up the car and you would be having to fill it up with approximately twice as much oil as it would take to charge up a 66 kilowatt hour battery pack. Whether you get the same range is a whole different issue, etc. But anyway, so factually, the Facebook post is very, very incorrect. Saying six barrels of oil is ridiculous. Eight gallons of oil makes a lot more sense. And again, that's about a fifth of a barrel. So it's about 20% of a barrel. And that, according to Ian Miller, is also taking account of any losses in transmission, right? So it's generation losses, transmission losses, and then charging losses at your car itself. Um, and then, of course, we get to the most important aspect of this in some ways. I guess it's not the most important, but it's a very important aspect, which is that, again, according to Miller, even if you were using the worst case scenario, which is completely coal fired power plants charging up your car, you would only be putting approximately 100 grams of CO2 into the atmosphere while doing this, whereas an automobile would put about 280 grams of CO2 into the atmosphere. So in terms of greenhouse gases, you're looking at 2.8 times more greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. And also, there are a lot of par particulate matters, not just CO2, but like things like, um, oh God, like sulfides and things. I, gosh, what am I thinking of? <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of nasty chemicals that come out of the tailpipe of an automobile, even with a catalytic converter. And all of those things are localized. One of the big things about power generation for electricity is that it's done in large plants. And there is a huge efficiency to generating energy in a large power plant as opposed to a small one. Your car is a teeny, teeny power plant and it's very inefficient. It generates a lot of heat. The 
heat has to be exhausted in a larger power plant, the heat that is there can happen over a larger area so you can keep things more stable. You can run it all the time, right? Car engines are cold and that you start them up and they're very inefficient when they start, then they heat up and then you get to the grocery store, you turn them off, they cool back down again, inefficient, you turn them back on, they heat back up, right? So a power plant can run more continuously than something like that. So you're getting a lot of efficiencies, but also you're doing it in a centralized area, generally, you know, kind of away from where people are. And at least you've got large smokestacks. So Again, absolute worst case scenario, we're talking about centralized production of power. We're talking about very tall smokestacks that put it up out of the range of normal people. Uh, in general, uh, there are protections, right? There's things as the as the exhaust comes out of these smokestacks, it's cleaned and a lot of that is recaptured, a lot of the nasty stuff and not the carbon necessarily, but at least the nasty chemicals that are being produced along with it. So it's in general, a cleaner way to go. And obviously if you're producing less CO2 plus less localized particle matter, you're doing a better thing for the environment overall and for people's breath, right? There's no question that, you know, you look at pictures of Los Angeles from the early 1970s, you can't see the skyline. It was terrible. And then when these sort of fuel standards and the catalytic converters and everything were put onto cars, that immediately started cleaning it up. And then it's better now, it's not perfect. And then there's of course pictures of Los Angeles during the height of the pandemic in like April of 2020, when the sky was beautiful and totally clear because there was nobody driving around. So getting rid of that localized production of particulate matter doesn't help the global situation out that much, but it helps we human beings because we're not breathing that in. And so you can see that with other towns too, like Beijing is a is a poster child of, of cities that have had terrible, terrible pollution and really significant issues. So that would be another really good case. And again, driving electric cars reduces the localized production of particulate matter and makes things a lot better and makes it better for you to breathe. Now, it doesn't solve the overall problem, but of course, this Facebook post like kind of ignored the fact that the electrical grid is moving very rapidly towards more green options, including solar, including wind, and including nuclear. I mean, nuclear is greener in terms of releasing things into the atmosphere. I know it's not an ideal solution because it produces a lot of terrible, nasty things that are, are radioactive for you know five to 10,000 years. I'm a big fan of the thorium-based reactors. I hope that they actually make a comeback and I hear in China, they're actually making significant tr strides towards getting thorium salt reactors working. And so anyway, that would be lovely and that would be a really nice way to create baseline power. Because one of the problems with wind and solar, of course, is that it's intermittent. So you've either got the choice of creating large mega packs, right, that Tesla's doing, where you just put as many power walls together, or big sort of versions of power walls. You put those all together, you charge up via solar or wind, and then those things discharge overnight or when it's cloudy or when it's not windy. So that's the way that works. But a kind of on a large scale, at least a more efficient way to do this would to be to use something like a thorium salt reactor to create the baseline. And then you have solar and wind to peak those things out. And thorium is a much, much better environmental option in terms of not, number one, it, it really can't melt down. Uh, it's almost impossible for that to happen because you have to take active steps to make the reaction take place. It's very cool. I should do an episode on this sometime. Let me know if you're interested in that. I would love to do one on the thorium salt reactors. But anyway, there's also a lot of other videos out there. So so anyway, you can check it out, but let me know if you'd be interested in that. Uh, but anyway, so it can't really melt down. And also the radioactive... Um, Isotopes that it produces are only radioactive for a couple of hundred years as opposed to like 10,000 years. So you can kind of bury those in a place where you can assume that the half-life is going to make them non-radioactive relatively quickly compared to uranium type um, nuclear reactors. So anyway, you've got the options of solar, wind, um, hydro, whatever. I, I've talked about this before. One of the big advantages of electric vehicles is that even if they're not super much cleaner right now, the chance of they will become cleaner and cleaner over time. Your gas car, when you buy a gas car, that car is going to be just as dirty forever. In fact, it's going to get more dirty because the engine's going to age, the catalytic converter won't work as well. So it'll just get more dirty over time. Whereas your electric car is going to get cleaner over time because all of the carbon, pretty much all of the carbon that's created for, is, is in the building process of the car, not in the driving process of the car. It's a lot of it is involved in that. So anyway, it's 
cleaner now. Ignore the Facebook post. I can't believe this, but USA Today, good for you guys for doing some journalistic research and making that happen. I will post a link to the to the USA Today article in the in the description. I'm not going to put the Facebook post on because that's just it's a ridiculous post, and you know it's that kind of thing. It's spreading F it's spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So anyway, I, so even though right now, worst case scenario, electric cars are already better for the environment and in terms of energy for charging up. But over time and in a cleaner grid, like a lot of places in the world that have gone quite a bit solar and wind and certainly on the west coast of the United States and even in Georgia, they're doing a lot of solar installations here. It's a, it's a good place for it. It's very sunny around here. So every time there's a new solar installation or a new wind installation put in, that means that your electric is even cleaner to charge up than it was before. So this is the worst case scenario that we're talking 70 pounds of coal or eight gallons of gasoline. That's the worst case. And it's only better depending on the situation you're in. And it's only better in the future because things are going to get greener. That's the way the electric grid is going. So anyway, yeah, we can ignore that stuff. Anyway, I'm definitely going to try to do, we're going to Mexico leaving tomorrow morning. So uh, wish us luck on that. I'll do some, I'll do some kind of like this videos while I'm there. I won't really be able to edit them very well, but I'll try to keep up with the, you know, mean things that are happening. But I really do, me and uh, me and Misinformation want to do a one year review of our car because I can't believe we've had this thing for exactly a year now. So Anyway, we'll do that maybe driving to the airport tomorrow. We will see. In the meantime, have a lovely day. And remember, combat the FUD, man. <laughs> I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.